I hope you will forgive me for being naive on some of the specific HIV issues. I'm not an HIV specialist, I'm a pure epithologist. Uh, I'm going to start with something which is a little bit more familiar for me, which is uh, HCV and the use of HCV positive organs. And so we'll see some of the epidemiology and the use of HCV organ in HCV positive recipient and the, the use of HCV organ in HCV negative recipient. Uh, we know that there is a gap between the need for organs and the number of patients which are in need for transplant. So the use of HCV positive organs is a way to expand the pool of organs that we can use. And, and of course, HCV is widely diffused around the world and we have very different epidemiologies in terms of prevalence and in terms of different genotypes. So, we shouldn't use a rule which is valid for everybody, but every single area should use uh, rules which are adapted to the local epidemiology, and that is an important issue. And speaking about epidemiology, this is a study that says that uh, all potential donors uh, are around 5.5% uh, of the organ pool. But then we can have patient at low risk with no risk factor for an infection, and you drop to 3.4. But you can be as high as 18% in high risk donors. So there is a pool that can be used. And indeed, in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been an increase of use of those organs, especially in the United States. Of course, now the future is much brighter than before because using an organ in the pre-DA era was much different than use it in today. And of course, when you use those graphs, you have to put on uh, the weight, on the balance, the risk of the transmission, the quality of the screening of your uh, donor, uh, the level of replication, the capability of detecting the replication. And of course, you have to match the status between the two patients. But of course, you have great benefits because you increase the chance of being transplanted and especially important in emergency transplantation. And you have to minimize the risk and maximize the benefit. And so you have to have a proper selection of donor and recipient and controlling the risk and doing a proper treatment for them. Now the point is that all donors are screened for HCV status meant that they do an ELISA testing for HCV, which is not exactly what we need because only 50 to 60% of donors are actually replicating, which is about 20 to 25% less that we see in general population. We still don't know if it is a selection bias or it's a different history of population, but that's the point. Uh, we should do a NAT testing, uh, so we have a quick response when the uh, procurement agency is signaling the, the donor because that is important. We will never have, on a quick way, a genotyping. Uh, it takes a little bit longer than the few hours that we usually have. So if we don't have a previous history for that patient, this is a factor that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And of course, different organs have different risk of transmission just for the procedure. If you do a kidney transplant, you have about half percent, 50 percent of the chances of transmitting the infection. Uh, it drops to one out of four of heart graft without doing anything. But of course, if you give somebody a liver, you have 100 percent chances of transmitting the infection if the liver is viremic. If it is not viremic, you basically have no chance, no risk of transmitting the infection. So let's see some of the data, which are all data, of course are pre-DAA data, most of the cases. And what is important is that we have learned that some donor factors are important. And as you can see, if you are over 50 years old of age, which is never seen in my country, the average age of our donors is way above 65, so we would dream to have a 50 years old donors, donor. But if you are over 50 and you have a, a HCV infection, that graft is going to uh, do much worse than any other condition. This is pre-DAA era, of course. And it is true for the graft and for the patient survival. Uh, then if you check how do they do 
over 1,200 patients which received an HCV positive graft compared to the 60,000 patients that were transplanted with normal graft, you see that there is a difference in survival. But then if you adjust for MELD, for etiology, for comorbidities, and for timing the waiting list and so forth, there's no more difference in getting a C-positive organ if you are C-positive. Uh, this is a case control study from Europe. They matched 63 uh, transplant with non-HCV positive organs with 63 HCV positive organs. There's no difference in patient survival and grass survival dividing the patient between C-replicating, uh, anti-HCV positive, but no longer replicating, and negative for the antibody. But this is a short observation, three years, and if you check, patients which are replicating, they have a, a shorter HCV recurrent free survival, and if the fibrosis is greater than one, which means two and more, then you drop in terms of survival uh, and the risk of uh, development of disease. Again, this is all pre-DAA era. Uh, this is another study in, uh, in which they set the cutoff to 45, which is a nightmare for me. And again, if you have a donor which is over 45 and is HCV, then your graph is going to do worse. But then if you correct for all the variables and you start checking the rec most recent years, then you can see that there's no longer difference in transplanting a C-positive organ in a C-positive uh, patients. What happens with the genotype? What is interesting is that just one genotype will dominate after the transplant, and in in this series, for example, six out of nine grafts actually became the one of the donor. Uh, and in another study, what they found out is that in the 23 liver recipients which actually acquired the new genotype, they actually did better compared to the one that which remained with their own genotype. It's all interesting, but it's just speculation because with the new drugs, it's no longer going to be a major problem. It's more interesting to see what happens if we use an HCV positive organ in a negative patient. And this is a study that you have already seen before, the one of the adjustment propensity score. Uh, the, the funny part is that they had a huge number of patients receiving a positive organ and they were negative. So they basically state in the paper that there was no really different in survival, but there's no specific sub-analysis, so we, we have we don't have a, such a quality study to see that we do see a difference. Uh, this is a much uh, smaller study, but you still have a 193 patient, recipient negative, donor positive, and the match recipient negative and donor positive does much worse. And this is the only study who shows that. Again, pre-DAA era. And these are only two patients, and of course, you can have any statistical difference matching two patients to 60 patients in terms of uh, recurrence of the disease. Uh, this is a simple proposal from the I ILTS. It's a modified proposal from DDA Samuel. And if you have an anti-HCV anti positive donor, uh, you may know HCV RNA or not. It doesn't matter. What you need to do is to do a biopsy. If it is less than F2, you can accept the organ. If it is greater than F2, you will not accept the organ. It's very simple. Anybody can do, even in a pathologist. This is what we expect now. We have virtually 100%. We can treat basically anybody before or after transplant. So all that I've told you now is just that. Uh, we have to change our mind. And <clears throat> so we had a conference almost one year ago just to decide what to do with these organs. And it, we came out with uh, some statements, and the first one that we recommend the use of anti-HCV positive graft in anti-HCV positive recipients. And there is a moderate evidence, because the literature is what you have seen, but it is a strong recommendation. And we recommend against the use of graft from donors with F2 fibrosis. And even this is a strong recommendation. Then we suggest a limited use of anti-HCV positive graft in anti-HCV 
negative recipient because we don't have enough evidence. Uh, but with the new drug, I think we can actually stretch this and move forward. And we recommend to treat that all these liver transplant patients should be treated as soon as possible after transplantation. We had a recent experience treating the patient from the operating room through the NG tube with sofosbuvir and ribavirin, and we have per protocol respond 100% with the worst combination ever. So I think we have a bright future behind our shoulders. Uh, this is another uh, consensus because, of, of course, it's a hot topic. And so the American Society of Transplantation got this consensus, and they actually estimated that in the United States you can have as much as 500 organs more to use, which is a lot. And so you can use them for kidneys also, and it has been done largely. There's no difference in 10 years outcome using those positive organs. And you can dramatically shorten the waiting time. You can drop from 3.6 years to nine months waiting time. So it makes a huge difference. We don't have such uh, big results in terms of numbers in uh, lung transplantation. Uh, in the small series or reports, there's no difference in survival, but it has very small numbers. The uh, attitude at using those organs is very poor less than 20% of the centers would use a positive organ. So I think we need to work in change this attitude. For the heart, we have a little bit more studies, but there is the same poor attitude. And uh, there was some evidence that they had a worse outcome in the pre-DAA era. So everybody is skeptical, and I think we should modify this also. So let's move to HIV positive graft which is a new frontier. This is the outline of what we will be looking for. So why should we use them? Well, life expectancy, you know that very well, among HIV-infected individuals has dramatically improved in the last decades. But we know that those patients are prone to die for liver and kidney disease, basically, because that's the, the story. And there is a high prevalence of B and C infection. And they do have excellent outcome after solid organ transplantation, and there are several series testifying that. And since we do have a shortage of, of organs, using HIV-positive organ is a, an excellent way to expand the pool. Uh, but even though out of an average of 5,000 transplants in the United States, as you can see, you never do more than 30 a year, which is the top of using HIV organs. And we will see how many are probably available. Uh, but the number are growing with the time passing. And I think the driver is not only the good heart therapies, but it's the therapy for the HCV, of course. And if you check, uh, there is a good response in terms of survival if you match HIV positive organs with HIV negative uh, recipients, I apologize. Uh, so there's no difference overall, but if you check uh, the subgroup of HCV people, they are the one which are actually fading worse. So HCV and HIV is still a bad combination in a pre-DAA era. And indeed, as you can see, if you check liver transplantation in co-infected HCV and HIV, there is a decrease in survival at five and 10 years. And this is all due to HCV recurrence. But now time has changed. This is a study of interferon-free therapy. We have a 700 HIV negative patient. Uh, a number of them were treated for recurrence after transplantation uh, with DAA with 95% success. But again, a series of 250 HIV positive patients 47 were treated with EAA, 94% success. So we can treat successfully those people. And this is a short series from Italy, from our centers, Milan and other centers in Italy. And as you can see, we have 96% uh, uh, modified intention to treat survival with any of those combination of treatments. So we can successfully treat and change the natural history of the recurrence for these patients which is the epidemiology. Again, we have 
0.21% of all donors will be HIV positive, so not very many, but you can go up to 0.5 if you take uh, the high risk donor, and, and this is the population we should look into. And uh, we do have clinical problems with those patients, because if you are a patient with a kidney disease, you have a 14 time risk of worsening your condition if you are an HIV positive, as you know, and, and it, it has increased the prevalence of patients with renal problem among HIV positive from the 90s to 2010. But what is more important is that five-year survival is much lower on dialysis if you are co-infected. And if you have a, a liver disease, your mortality in the waiting list is a, as high as 36% compared to an average of 10 to 15. So uh, our, those patients are at risk and a clinical risk, and we need to see if we can accelerate their access to transplant. So let's see which are the initial experience using positive organs. This has been the first experience, four cases reporting from South Africa, HIV positive donor and recipient for kidney transplant. Dr. Muller eventually reported on the New England a full series of 27 recipients. As you can see, they were very well compensated in terms of HIV disease, CD4 count over 200, no viral load or less than 50. Uh, a vast, the vast majority of the patients, they did have the HIV-associated nephropathy, which is very prevalent in South Africa. And as you can see, the 15 donors, most of them, they actually donated both the organs, very young, young donors. We don't see that young donors in our country. And what is important, because we'll get back to that, is that 14 of them, they were naive to treatment, which is an important observation. And these are the results, which are absolutely good, in line with normal, let's say, transplantation with non-HIV positive organs. And suppression of HIV was absolutely maintained. I want to draw your attention on the rejection rate. We'll go back very quickly on this. It's 22% in three years, which is a little bit higher than what we would expect in this category. And only three patients out of 27 had a recurrence, histological recurrence of uh, recurrent HIV nephropathy. Uh, so we need to learn how to match donor and recipient in this specific setting. And in 1998 in the, eight, in the United States there was raised a ban against the use of HIV positive organs. So it was a federal law, you could not use them. But then it was shown that you could use up to 600 HIV positive organs around the country, which is a, 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 an important number to, to, to fight the organ shortage. So there was uh, a, a need to fill this uh, uh, organ shortage. And so it was passed the Organ Policy Equity Act in November 2013 which was actually reversing the ban, and you could use HIV-positive donor in HIV-positive recipient in the country. It was signed on November 21, 2013. And it is a protocol. It's a pilot study. There are rules. And the first rule is that you have to have a patient, a candidate, uh, a recipient with no active opportunistic infection or cancer. There is a difference in CD4 counts between kidney which is 200, and liver, which is 100, and it's due to portal hypertension, and it is in every situation. And of course, HIV needs to be suppressed on an, HIV, on an effective art. And as far as donor inclusion criteria, you need to have a CD4 counts over 200, so disease in control. Uh, you should have less than 50 copies if you do have a history of HIV infection. If you have no history of HIV infection, there's no specific requirement because, you, of course, you are not supposed to be uh, on any therapy. Less than one antiretroviral class and no active opportunistic infection. It's interesting because rule has been set also for the living donor, which is important. Uh, the program is ongoing. These numbers are already greater than this. Uh, what is important is that even with the small number between kidneys and livers, there's no difference in terms of rejection-free survivals. 
And, but we do have some virological consideration to keep in mind, which I'm sure that you are more familiar than me. And one is HIV superinfection. You all know that, uh, the transmission of a second distant strain for one patient to the other, in this case, case from donor to recipient. And this is observed in all mode of transmission. Uh, and the rates are similar to primary infection. The problem is that we have no idea what is the real impact in donor and recipient because there are no data so far to understand if it is going to be an issue. Uh, HIV tropism, of course, is another issue. Uh, what happens if we put an X4 tropic, for example, organ on an X, on an R5 patient, which is on Maraviroc, for example? So we need to learn how to switch antiviral therapy. Sometimes we need to put a protease inhibitor in the therapy in some patient which is not doing that. And, and this can have an impact on uh, the management of the post-transplant. But the point is that you can only have one chance to know that if you know the history and the chart of that donor. Because if you want to test this, it's going to take a week. So the point is, should we use organs from HIV positive patient of which we know nothing about the history? Is it a risk that we can take so far? Or we need to have a donor which is eligible only if we do have his HIV history and heart therapy history, which I think is important. Uh, and the same is for resistance that can be transferred from donor to recipient. And of course, uh, it can be a possible impact in terms of switching uh, heart therapy. And of course, you can have a window time in which your therapy is failing and you need to change. If you don't care, take care of this, you can actually be infectious from, for somebody in your family, for example. So we really need to know the history of those patients. Uh, I was mentioning rejection and late, latent opportunistic infection. Is it a problem? I mean, we were worried about this when we were transplanting HIV patient. Now, is it a, an issue when we use positive organs? Uh, there is a slight increase in rejection and everybody agrees that it is on, uh, uh, due to a learning curve on how to use immunosuppressive agents, especially cyclosporine and FK, uh, with protease inhibitor or in the initial phase retornavir based heart because that can have an important impact on the level of the immunosuppressor. Just to give you an example, if you are on 0.5 milligram twice a day of FK and you use a retornavir based regimen, you're going to go to 0.5 once a week. So you can have fluctuation that can actually be dangerous, especially in the kidney rather than in the liver, which is more prone to rejection. And this is from the American experience, you do have an increase in rejections just due to this reason, but no difference in terms of opportunistic infection, rectoviremia, malignancy, graft failure, or death. So what should we do when we see that we have a positive organ and we have potentially someone that we can use? Of course, if we have an undetectable HIV, we put the patient on antiviral treatment, it's a low risk of HIV superinfection and drug resistance because it's going to be a first-line regimen, is most of the time it's going to be an R5 tropic, and, and you can actually have a lot of potential using a protease inhibitor regimen, and you usually have a higher CD4 count in those patients. So these are the easy ones. But then if you have a detectable level, uh, the patient could be on antiretroviral treatment or have had several failure or could be naive to that. But this is a higher risk donor because you can be on a second line heart, you can have a harbor an X4 tropic virus which is present in up to 50% of long-term heart or people with lower count of CD4. Uh, usually those people, they do have a history of drug resistance and, and so uh, lower CD4 count. So they are the risky one and you need to really focus on them. So I think these are the first step of a long journey and as always you need to take the first step to make a long, long road. Thank you for your attention.